Um, so let's do some nomenclature problems involving stereochemistry. Uh, starting with this cyclic example in the top left corner. Um, so, of course, when you're uh, naming a compound, you have to determine what the uh, parent chain is, right? And the parent chain is generally going to be um, the cyclic compound in IUPAC nomenclature. Um, and if there are two cyclic compounds, such as this one, uh, where we have a four-membered ring uh, and a six-membered ring, the parent is the larger uh, ring, or it's a cyclohexane derivative. So the parent chain, cyclohexane, will be the ending of this uh, IUPAC name. And then we have to include any substituents that are not uh, right within that six-membered continuous ring. Uh, so we have a methyl group, and the methyl group's directly across uh, from a cyclobutyl group, or a four-membered hydrocarbon that's cyclic, right? But these endings are YL uh, instead of a and E because they are substituents, they're not the main chain. Um, <clears throat> finally, you have to number this. Um, and with a ring, you have to say where the substituents are relative to one another. Um, so you could number it as one, four, uh, or you could think about starting at methyl and numbering uh, num one for methyl and four for cyclobutyl. Um, so the correct route here would be the red route, where we give the same total numbers either way, one and four, um, but now if you have to break that tie, you give the lower number to the compound that comes earlier in the alphabet, or the substituent starting with C gets number one. So putting it all together, we would alphabetize it and say one cyclobutyl, dash four dash methyl, cyclohexane, it's all one word. And uh, one more thing we need to make unambiguous uh, or specify is that we have a trans relationship, okay? So these two carbons that I'm about to highlight here, they are not chiral carbons because they lie along a plane of symmetry or they cannot be asymmetric centers if they lie along this plane of symmetry here. Uh, but they are achiral stereocenters. They don't have four unique groups, uh, but they have three unique groups bound, each of those carbons. And when you have achiral stereocenters, uh, this leads to the possibility of both cis and trans isomers. And we need to specify whether we have a cis or trans relationship about this six-membered ring. Um, so because one group, the methyl is coming forward, right, it does not see the cyclobutyl, which is always spending its time on the back of the ring. Rings are rigid, right, or they are tied together in cyclic, so you cannot rotate the bonds. And the cyclobutyl and the methyl are always, because of that, on opposite faces of the ring. Um, so this compound is trans, right? We have a trans relationship between the two substituents. So for alkenes, we say E versus Z, but for rings, we indicate cis versus trans. And there's just one trans relationship, so you say trans out front. And that's all lowercase. So with cyclic compounds, sometimes even when there is no R and S to be assigned, and included in the name, you still need to watch out for these achiral stereocenters, or those that are carbons, like the pink ones, with three unique groups bound, but not four. Uh, in a later example, we'll talk about how to address nomenclature with chiral stereocenters. And one of those examples is here with this cyclopentane derivative. Once again, the parent chain is a five-membered cyclic structure, so the ending will be cyclopentane. And we have two methyl groups, so dimethyl substituent. We have a two-carbon or ethyl substituent, and there's a bromo. And we want to start numbering this ring to get the lowest possible locant numbers. <clears throat> so uh, the best way to number it would either be 
one, two, three, starting at the ethyl to get the lowest possible numbers going um, in the clockwise direction. You could also do one, two, three. So we get the same total locant sum or sum of substituent numbers is the same, no matter whether we go clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, so once again, we're going to lift, listen to the alphabet and preferentially give the bromo position one, okay, or the bromo simply because it comes early in the alphabet, that's our next rule. So we'll say one bromo. The green numbering method is the correct method this time. Um, so if we put this together, before we address stereochemistry, um, out front it will be one dash bromo alphabet, alphabetized. So next is three dash ethyl. So the way you put them in the name does not have to do with their numbers, but we just alphabetize them all together. And then finally, we have dimethyl. Um, but these prefixes like di and tri are not alphabetized. Okay, that's just some rule uh, that someone made up and you have to remember it. So um, a lot of prefixes um, will, will not affect the ordering of the substituents <coughs> in the final name. So 3-ethyl remains before methyl. Okay, this is alphabetized according to M for methyl. And then we have 2 comma 2. We need a number for each methyl group, dash dimethyl. And then it's all one word from there, dimethylcyclopentane. Now, there's still some stereochemistry that's not yet clarified, right? We have wedges and dashes uh, or three-dimensionality shown in this molecule. So I'm going to erase some of these numbers so that we can assign R and S for the chiral stereocenters. And uh, this time, the chiral carbons are the ones that I'm indicating in orange, those have four unique groups bound. Um, and the methyl, uh, or sorry, the carbon with methyls has two of the same group, two methyls. So there's no way to determine R versus S. They're, it's not a chiral center. Um, so let's do R and S for these. <clears throat> so first for the carbon with bromine. Um, so bromine is the heaviest molar mass. It's heavier than carbon. And then a carbon, uh, with fewer hydrogens or, or zero, and all bonds to carbon is higher in molecular weight than a CH2. So that goes one, two, three. Or if you follow those orange numbers, all right, that's in the counterclockwise direction. So this is the S configuration. Uh, we know it's S because we're looking at it from the right face. The hydrogen must be on a dash if the bromine is on a wedge. That's implicit. And looking at it, where the lowest priority is back is the correct um, representation for R versus S. So we keep our answer as S. So in the IUPAC name, we'll clarify that carbon one has the S configuration, but we also need to do R and S uh, for carbon three. So this carbon is only attached to carbons and those carbons are simply attached to carbons and hydrogen. So number one now is on this side. Is the carbon with the most bonds to carbon, it has four of those, and it has no hydrogens. And then the CH2 here uh, beats the CH2 there in the ethyl group. Because that CH2 in the ethyl is one away from a methyl, which has more hydrogens than this side. So the more hydrogens on carbon, the lower priority it is. Once again, Ethyl's a wedge, so the hydrogen is understood to be underneath the ring. And if you're going to go this time, right, from one to two to three, that's in the clockwise direction, right? And the hydrogen's back, so we're looking at it correctly. This is the correct configuration of R. Okay, so just keep in mind here uh, what we've emphasized in a couple examples is that as you increase the number of hydrogens on a carbon, 
right? For example, the maximum hydrogens are on a methyl. Of course, if methyl is connected to a molecule, the most it can have uh, on one carbon is three H's. The more hydrogens you have, the lower priority, right? Because hydrogen is the least massive or the lowest priority element uh, on the periodic table. So this is only when you're comparing carbons that are only connected to other carbons and hydrogens. More hydrogens means lower priority. So that's how I determined this one, two, three here. So make sure that you are comfortable with those priority rules. Now, putting it all together, um, we have the S configuration at carbon one. So you say one S, and then we have the R configuration at carbon three. And you put that out front in parentheses. And uh, when there are multiple chiral centers, you must say which chiral center is R versus S with those coefficients. So that would be your complete and unambiguous IUBEC name. So notice that when you have cis versus trans, we use that descriptor for molecules that are not chiral, right, or have no R and S to be defined. Uh, but when the compound is chiral, then you must <clears throat> determine not just cis and trans, but even more specifically, R and S. You never need to report both for the same stereocenter. Let me do an acyclic example. This is a triene, or the alkene is the high priority functional group here. You want to number this so that the alkene has the earliest total locant numbers. So we have alkenes here starting at position one, stretching to two, starting at position three, stretching to four, and then five, stretching to six. So the longest chain I can get, including all those alkenes, is a seven-membered. So this is hepta, but it's not heptane, right? It's going to end in ene because it's an alkene. It's not a single alkene, it's a hepto one, three, five, right? Because triple bond or the double bond, excuse me, starts at one, three, and five triene. To make that unambiguous as to where the triple bonds are. Um, so seven carbons are included in that chain, but two are not, right? We have this ethyl substituent here branching off of carbon four. So I'll say four ethyl. And then we have a chloro branching off of carbon five. And we'll alphabetize those and put them in the complete name. Five chloro goes first. Separate them by dashes, four dash ethyl. And then it's one continuous word with the parent chain. Now for alkenes, once again, there can be stereochemistry, right? Because these pi bonds are all rigid. They can't rotate, meaning we could have cis, which would be distinct from trans, right? And in alkene nomenclature, uh, we use E and Z to distinguish those. So let's check out each double bond and make sure that it's E versus Z applicable. So, uh, on one carbon of this alkene, you have two identical groups, which means I could never say which one is higher priority, right? So there is no E or Z to be defined. Just like if you don't have four different groups on a chiral center, then there's no R and S to be defined. So double bond one will not be need a designation, but double bond starting at three uh, will. So notice that if you're now comparing the two sp2 carbons and their direct substituents, okay, we first look at the one that's carbon three. It is connected to a hydrogen, which is less massive than this vinyl group or a double bond. So that's the higher priority on carbon three. Now looking at carbon four, there's an ethyl group and that is lower priority than this carbon that's attached to a heavy atom chlorine. So I've circled the two high priority groups. If you dissect the pi bond, right, this is the bond that we cannot rotate about. 
you must cross that dotted line to go from high priority vinyl to high priority chlorovinyl. So those are trans, uh, and someone decided to make that E for alkenes, okay? Same meaning though. For, for rings, we say cis-trans. For alkenes, uh, we say EZ. So then there's one more double bond to examine. So I've got to clean this up a bit. But now it's this four or this five, six pi bond that cannot rotate. On carbon five, the heavier atom is chloro as compared to carbon four. Okay. On carbon six, draw in the hydrogen here, right? It's at 120 degree bond angle. The hydrogen is less massive than carbon. So now these two groups are on the same side of this dotted line. And therefore they are cis or Z. So I need to say, right, that double bond three is E, but double bond five is Z out front. Once again, we use these coefficients to make it unambiguous. Okay, so just like RNS, you deal with that the same way. And it's based on the same rules, molar mass of direct substituent. Um, okay, so be, be sure you're comfortable assigning RS, E, and Z. And we talked about a lot of those last time, so I want to do some other things next. But if you need more practice, there are ample videos that I've sent, um, and they're labeled as stereochemistry videos. Um, the final compound here is a cyclic alkene. So once again, the parent chain is that cycle, but it's not cyclohexane, it's cyclohexene. And we give the alkene priority relative to alkanes and relative to halides like chloro. So I start numbering there. And I'd rather start numbering there, one, where we have a methyl, so we can get the lowest number possible for methyl. One, two, three, we'll have a three chloro. Four, five, we'll have a five isopropyl. All right, this is a three carbon chain, propyl but it's branched in the middle, where it's not linear, so it's isopropyl. Five isopropyl, three chloro, and one methyl are the substituents. Okay. Um, so if you're going to put all these together, once again, just according to the alphabet, three dash chloro, once again, ISO is technically not alphabetized. That's probably a really minute rule that you may not need to worry about, uh, but it's alphabetized according to propyl. Uh, so it comes after methyl. So we say one methyl dash five dash isopropyl cyclohex one ene. Now I do have some stereochemistry to worry about. Um, so this double bond here uh, is not ambiguous as to whether it's E or Z. Um, so you don't have to label it because it's a cyclic alkene. And you guys haven't learned about rings that are large enough to have double bonds that are trans. Okay, it does turn out to have Z geometry, but because it's locked in a ring, it must be Z in that case. So I don't need to label that for a cyclic alkene. I did label E and Z for acyclic alkenes because then it's not known. It could be cis or trans, not locked in a ring there. But I do need to uh, designate R and S for chiral centers, right? Uh, this carbon with chloro has four unique groups. One's chloro, one is the hydrogen that's back, right? Those are substituents one and four. Chloro is the heaviest. And then this carbon here, let me erase some numbers so we can be clear. This carbon here 
is number two because it has a single bond and a double bond or three total bonds to carbon and only a single hydrogen. This carbon is three because it's only connected to two carbons, right? Or has two bonds to carbon and two to hydrogen. More hydrogens is lower priority. So one, two, three appears to be clockwise. It truly is R because the hydrogen number four is in the correct spot going back. There's one more chiral center to take care of. Let me do this one in a different color. So now looking at this chiral center, the hydrogen must be a wedge forward because the isopropyl is the dash backwards. And if you look at these three carbons here, here, and here, the direct attachments, we go one at a time, okay? This is a CH2, only connected to carbons and hydrogens. This is another CH2. So don't be looking at this other stuff yet. Just go one atom at a time and trace it, okay? We'll find the smallest difference. We got two CH2 so far. Those are lower priority than this carbon, which is a CH or only has one hydrogen and therefore is higher priority or has three bonds to carbon atoms, one, two, three. So the isopropyl uh, is actually number one here outside of the ring. It's kind of hard to see. And then if you look at these two carbons, they were both CH2s. So there's no way to distinguish between them yet. So we move one atom in each direction, keep tracing along the structure. Now we reach a carbon with chloro that is far heavier in molar mass than any carbon just bound to carbon. So one bond to a heavy atom beats 100 bonds to any lighter atom. That's the rule. You don't have to sum things up and think about it too hard. As long as it's got one bond directly to something heavier, that's priority two, and it beats this CH2, priority three, right? One, two, three appears to be clockwise, but it's not truly R, it's actually S, because the hydrogen is coming at us. So we're looking at it exactly the wrong way. We should be looking from behind the screen. So if the wedge group is number four, you flip your answer, or if the lowest molar mass is coming at you, then it's really the opposite of clockwise. It's actually counterclockwise and S. So I'm going to put those out front here and that'll finish up our nomenclature. So uh, the methyl carbon was not chiral, but then the chloro was. So position three was R and position five was S. Okay, so I can't imagine the nomenclature getting much more complicated than those examples where we have E and Z for double bonds, cis and trans for rings, and then R and S for chiral centers. Obviously, you must know how to apply IUPAC rules, but for the most part, um, if you can understand each piece of those examples, th that covers your basis on uh, nomenclature.